Now notice that this wind came almost like a tornado or like a hurricane. It came with force and it came sooner than expected. It probably startled even those who were waiting. They didn't know what was going to happen. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, but they didn't expect a wind. Especially, how do you have a wind in a building? chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. I believe we'll go to about verse 13, but we'll see. Today we're going to talk about the disciples being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now remember, the disciples had gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem for a prayer meeting. This meeting continued for days with about 120 people present. And during this time, they studied the scriptures, they prayed together, and they waited for the Holy Spirit to come. Peter stood up one day and he declared to the group that Judas should be replaced as one of the apostles. And uh, according to the scripture, this seemed good to the group. And so two men were chosen as being qualified to serve a man named Justice and another man named Matthias. And what qualified them is they had, begin, they had been with Jesus and the disciples from the time of John's baptism to when he ascended. Both men had followed Christ faithfully for three and a half years. And after praying to God, who searches the hearts of men, they cast lots and the lot fell on Matthias. And so they took Matthias, uh, considering this lot thing as being from the Lord, and Matthias was numbered uh, with the 12. Okay, so let's begin reading here in um, Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your spirit. And we ask you just to guide us through your word now. Teach us what you want us to know. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the story of the Holy Spirit coming to baptize the believers. Now, the scripture here pinpoints two particular aspects about the coming of the Holy Spirit that deserve particular notice. The when and the where this event occurred. The when, well, it was when the day of Pentecost had fully come. What well, was Pentecost? Well, the year, about A.D. 30, this is the time we're talking about. The 50th day after Jesus' resurrection. The 10th day after his ascension. This particular Pentecost was on a Sunday. And that contributes to making Sunday the day that Christians would meet together. Make Sunday special to us. At this time, Jerusalem would be filled with worshipers again. It was all, it was also occurred as far as the wind goes. It occurred when the disciples were all in one accord. So important. Now, how did the Holy Spirit come? He came with wind and fire. Very interesting. Now, we often read in the Old Testament of God's coming down in a cloud. But the Holy Spirit doesn't come down in a cloud. He comes as a wind and with fire. Do you know what winds do? Winds dispel the clouds. <laughs> they push the clouds away. The Holy Spirit didn't come with a cloud. He came as a wind to dispel the clouds that can overspread men's minds. 
Remember, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come to teach you all things, to lead you into all truth. But he came as fire also, and fire is something that warms us and gives us light. In a cold, dark world, we need fire. Fire is comforting. I love to sit in front of a fire and watch it. I love to smell a fire. Fires are nice. Now notice that the wind came suddenly, and it didn't come gradually as most winds do. We've had a few windy days in Roger City, and and the, the banners on our store start to flip and flop like that. But the winds come softly, generally. But not this wind. This wind came instantly. Now, our family has gone through a hurricane over this past week. And I don't know if you've ever been in a hurricane. I have been. And uh, I've been in the eye wall of the hurricane when it's all calm. The winds are blowing, winds are blowing, and then all of a sudden it stops. And you know that the eye of the hurricane is over you. And inside that eye, it's pretty calm. Not much going on, but you know something. <laughs> the other side of that, that wall is coming, and when it comes, the winds are going in the opposite direction, and boy, they hit with force. They hit with force. Now notice that this wind came almost like a tornado or like a hurricane. It came with force and it came sooner than expected. It probably startled even those who were waiting. They didn't know what was going to happen. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, but they didn't expect a wind. Especially, how do you have a wind in a building? There you go. And the Bible says there was a sound from heaven Maybe like a thunderclap. <laughs> this was very uh, odd occurrence. It was a strong and violent sound and wind that came into this prayer meeting with great power. If you can understand when I say it probably would have freaked him out, it probably would have. Who left the window open? Where'd that wind come from? It filled not just the upper room, but it also filled the whole house. And I imagine it probably alarmed the whole city. Now, what about the fire? Well, it came and it sat. It sat on the disciples. Now, every time I've seen a picture that some artist tries to paint of this event, it looks like there's a, like a little big lighter on top of everybody's head, you know, a little, little flame going there. Uh, I don't know what it looked like. The description we have is tongues of fire. So it was probably like an open flame. And I want you to notice here that each disciple received the same spirit individually. It sat on each individual's head. You know, that tells me that the Lord wants to fill each of us with his Holy Spirit and that each of us matter, not just collectively, but individually. Now, John the Baptist prophesied this sign when speaking of Jesus. You remember, John had said of Jesus, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, if it's significant enough for John the Baptist to point out, then I think we are, do ourselves a good service here to consider this fire and to think about it. You see, the Holy Spirit, like a fire, comes to do certain things. You know what a fire can do? If I put a marshmallow in there on a stick in the fire, you know it's going gonna, it's gonna to melt it. The Holy Spirit is like a fire. And you know what it can do? The Holy Spirit can melt hard hearts. Hard hearts. We were talking about hard hearts in Sunday school. And Peggy, you mentioned that the Holy Spirit is the one that works on people's hard hearts. 
and he can do that. Now remember, they're waiting for the Holy Spirit because they're going to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They need his power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to melt the hard hearts of, of men. You know what else fire is good for? Burning up dross. My old grandfather, we called him Gran. He got in trouble one day. He was from Tennessee and uh, he was a farmer out in Tennessee and he moved to Detroit to work for the auto industry and in his yard, he had a he had a yard. He was going to plant a plant a garden, and you know what he did? He did what they would do in Tennessee. He went out and he set that whole field on fire, because <laughs> that's what they do to prepare the soil. They set it on fire. Well, in my grandfather's case, the fire department showed up and put it out. <laughs> Told him he couldn't do that anymore. But you see, the fire comes and burns things up, purifies things. It burns up the dross. And that's like the Holy Spirit. He comes and burns up the things that aren't necessary in our life and that are harmful. But I think the most wonderful thing about a fire is the warmth and the comfort that it gives us. Because of its warmth, we can cook our food. And because of its warmth, we can see at night. And the Holy Spirit is like that. He warms us. And he loves us. And this is the type of fire that Christ sends on the earth. Now, with these signs, the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And they begin to speak God's praises in other tongues, it says. They were more filled with the Holy Spirit than they ever had been before. Please note that. They spoke not one language each, but many languages. We may suppose that as they spoke, they didn't understand what they were saying, but they were speaking in different languages, not because they had learned them, but because the Holy Spirit was enabling them. Lubit tibya, lubit minya, zroslik imalikik, lubit isus, lubit da yevne an igara da, food chesne strane delarus, belarus. You say, what did you just say? I just sang a song for you in Russian. Can I speak Russian? No. <laughs> I can't speak Russian. A little bit, I just did, a little bit, but I don't even, I probably said it really badly. You see, this was not a, a supernatural enabling for them to learn how to speak Russian or to speak Chinese or to speak something like that. This was a supernatural thing that happened and came upon them. And they spoke fluently as the Spirit moved on them. And how do we know they spoke fluently? Because the people that were standing around were from all parts of the world and they said, what's going on here? They're speaking in our language, the language we come from. How did this happen? They're fishermen from Galilee. This is, this is a miracle. It was, it was a miracle. The Holy Spirit moved on them and they spoke fluently as the Spirit enabled them. He gave them the words that they begin to speak out. Now let's go to verse five. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed. And they were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. These guys are drunk. <laughs> this is such an interesting story. 
I contend to you that they spoke probably those languages even without an accent. Um, because it was such a shocking thing to those who heard it. Yes, the disciples were given an extraordinary gift by God. They spoke in tongues in a miraculous way, and they spoke of the praises of God. Now, this issue of speaking in tongues is a controversial thing among the churches. People fuss and fight about speaking in tongues all the time. But I'll tell you what, I think you need to be careful. One time, uh, one of my children was speaking with another classmate that was, they were at a Christian school, as a matter of fact. And uh, this classmate said to my daughter, I don't know, this business of speaking in tongues, it's not even in the Bible. It's not even in the Bible. Well, <laughs> yeah, it is in the Bible. The reason you don't know it's in the Bible is because you don't read the Bible. You don't know the Bible as well as you should. It is in the Bible. And here we are looking at it here in Acts chapter 2. This was an extraordinary thing that God did. It was a miracle as they began to speak out the praises of God. And a great many people were in Jerusalem at this time to celebrate Passover. And these were devout folks, the Bible says. They weren't a sinful Mardi Gras type crowd. They had come from all nations, near and far, to worship the one true God. They had come to dwell in Jerusalem from all corners of the world to share in the blessings of God's kingdom at this particular time. And when they heard those disciples speak in tongues, they were amazed. They heard them speak in their native languages fluently. The Judeans noticed the loss of the disciples' northern Galilean accents. I shouldn't say a hillbilly accent, but, you know, they were kind of the, the, the people that were like considered the hillbillies of the day. They lost that accent. And the crowd began to assemble as the prayer meeting, it appears, flowed out into the streets. The wind had come, the fire had come, the miracle had come. Uneducated, simple men and women speaking and reasoning of God in a multitude of languages without a trace of an accent. Amazing. And the crowd could understand them individually, but not all. You see, those that were could speak the Phrygian language or the Egyptian language or the Libyan language, they understood but the others that didn't say, they didn't know that. They just, it sounded like Babel to them. Each member of the crowd spoke not so many languages as was now being heard. Remember, 120 people, they're speaking, <laughs> potentially speaking 120 different languages. It may be assumed that the disciples did not address the crowd in tongues, for the crowd appears to be standing back and observing. The disciples are speaking the praises of God and it appears that they're speaking to God and to each other without a natural sense of what they're saying. Now this is unique. These native tongues were most likely devalued in Jerusalem. They would have all been speaking Hebrew. But now each person listens attentively to the gospel being proclaimed in their own language is amazing. They heard the great things of God in a way they could easily understand. And this is the gift of the Holy Ghost. Do you know, as we go out to share the gospel with people, we need to be able to speak in a way that people will understand. <laughs> They certainly would have understand Hebrew, but God did this as a sign, a strange and powerful sign that convinced the hearers of the truth of their words. They heard the word of God in their own language. Aren't you thankful for groups like Wycliffe Bible Translators that have made it their goal to translate the Bible into all the languages of the world? 
People need to hear the gospel. And then when it's in their own language, it's, it's more effective, obviously. This miracle speaks of God's invitation and acceptance of anyone from anywhere if they would but come to him through Jesus Christ. It wasn't just Hebrew. It was all over. Jesus loves everybody in the whole wide world. And the people were amazed and they were excited. They took this sign as an indication from heaven to pay attention to the words of these men. You know, I tried to sing my little song for you in Russian and I messed it up. I can sing that same little song in Spanish or I can sing that little song in Telugu. Uh, anytime I've ever gone in any other part of the world, I try to memorize my song so I can sing it in their language. And you know what I found when I do that? Even though I have to use an interpreter to speak, when they hear my little song in their language, they all start to smile. And they sit up <laughs> and they try to listen because they know that this gringo is trying to speak Spanish and he can't, but he's trying. And they want to hear it in their language. This is important. Well, you know, we've read about the disciples so often. There have been so foolish at times. <laughs> they're just ignorant fishermen. So many times they've disappointed the Lord. And uh, most people would have thought of them as being foolish and ignorant people. And there were living in Jerusalem those who even thought these disciples were drunk. Well, who was the foolish one? Who was the ignorant one? It was the people that thought they were drunk and ridiculed them. But do you see the low opinion that the common people had of God's people, God's church? And the ignorance that they had? If anybody was drunk, it wouldn't have been the disciples. <laughs> they weren't drinkers. It wouldn't have been them. No, these people that were ignorant and calling the disciples names, they didn't know other languages. And as a result, they didn't understand the miracle. Let me point this out to you. I think sometimes it's because of ignorance and a predisposition against Christians that some people fail to understand the miracle of the gospel message. They fail to understand God's love that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. They fail to see it. It's ignorance on their part. We should pray, oh, Holy Spirit, fill me with your power in such a way that I too may have the ability to proclaim your goodness to the world in a way that is both miraculous and understood. Isn't that a good prayer? Lord, help me that way. I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Now, I'll just close with this. I'm done with my notes, but... I can't help but give my opinion on the controversy of speaking in tongues. All right, you ready? Everybody say hallelujah. All right, you just spoke in tongues. You just did. Don't say you didn't speak in tongues. You just did this morning. You said hallelujah. That's a word of praise to God in another language that neither you nor I really fully understand, but everybody around the world knows that. We're limited in our knowledge. We're limited in our abilities. We're limited in our intelligence. Sorry, but we are. We're limited. But the Holy Spirit is not. God speaks every language in the world. He understands every word that's spoken. And God is not too busy to listen to our prayers. He can hear us when we're calling out to him. God is not too busy. God is not too busy. God is not too busy to listen to our prayers. He can hear us calling. He can hear us calling. He can hear us calling out to him. Can I tell you that God cares about everybody? 
He cares about those who speak English, but not more than he cares about those who speak Spanish. He cares about those who speak French, but not more than those who speak German. He cares about those uh, uh, South Africans who speak the newest language that the world knows, Afrikaans. But he also cares about those tribesmen that click when they talk. If you've ever heard them, the clicking noise. God cares about the Chinese, but not more than he cares about the Japanese. He loves everybody in the whole world. And he understands every language that's spoken by men and angels. And if you tell me that the Holy Spirit is in your heart and in your life, and yet, uh, the, 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 yet, yet there's no such thing as speaking in tongues, then you have just limited the power of God. I got news for you. Brother Ravenhill told me one time, he said, it, it's, it's interesting that the miraculous usually appears on the front lines of our missionary endeavors. Let me just tell you something. If you want to see the miracle working power of God, get out there and be doing what the Lord's called you to do. And you might be surprised. You might walk on water and speak in tongues too. <laughs> if, if you were out there uh, doing what the Lord's called us to do, to go into all the world. I don't mean to get on your case. I'm talking to me too. Well, Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your spirit. And we thank you that you can enable us to have the ability to do what we need to do in this job that you've uh, tasked us with of going into all the world to preach the gospel. Help us, Lord, to be filled with your spirit. Help the wind and the fire of the spirit to flow on us and energize us and strengthen us so that we can go out into the world where there are many languages spoken and we can speak forth the praises of God in such a way that men and women, boys and girls all around this world will understand. Help us, Lord, empower us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.